Welcome everyone to our October Prince of Wales update on getting ahead advancements in ENT care. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. We recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. We also extend that respect to any Aboriginal colleagues who may be joining us today. Some housekeeping. At the end of this webinar, you will be emailed a link to an evaluation, which is important to provide feedback on the education and webinar experience. You need to complete this evaluation to receive a certificate, and certificates will be emailed within two weeks of this webinar. We will dedicate time to answer questions at the end of each presentation. So if you have a question, please submit it as clearly as possible in the question box on your screen throughout the webinar. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Julia Crawford, and Dr. Crawford will be speaking on the impact of human papilloma HPV on oral health. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. Hello, just making sure you can hear me all right? Yes, we um, can. Great. So um, thank you for the introduction and for asking me to speak. So I'm going to be talking about the impact that human papillomavirus has had on um, the epidemiology of ENT conditions, but most specifically for head and neck cancers and oropharyngeal cancers. Uh, so um, just in terms of my conflict of interest, I work as a proctor for device technology, which is the distributor of the Da Vinci robotic system in Australia. The objectives for the, the talk today are twofold. One is so that you can identify the common HPV subtype that causes oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. And secondly, is to describe what's the most common presenting symptom that you'll see in these types of, of patients. So the first thing we're gonna do is a poll, just looking at the risk factors for oropharyngeal cancers. Uh, and I think that Susan is going to run the poll now, the first one. So in terms of the risk factors, uh, is it A, female gender, two, six or more oral sexual partners, C, alcohol intake, or D, all of the above? I think we're just gonna give about 10, 15 seconds um, to submit before we go ahead. Susan, do we have a way of knowing um, how many people have polled? It will give us a percentage. So far, 89% voted. Right, should we close and go ahead? Sure. So actually, it, the answer is B, which is six or more oral sexual partners. So um, for HPV-related oropharyngeal cancers, it's much more common in female in the male gender. Uh, it's not actively associated with alcohol intake, although patients who smoke are at a higher risk of poor outcome. And so the answer is six or more oral sexual partners, and we'll go into that a little bit more in detail in a second. So when we're looking at um, HPV uh, itself, there's uh, 120 different subtypes of HPV carcinoma, um, of which are broken down into the high and low risk. And typically the reason they're broken down into that was based on cervical cancer. Um, and typically 16 and 18 are the most commonly associated with that. And of the HPV subtypes for oropharyngeal cancer, 90% of them are caused by HPV 16. So it's vastly the predominant um, one to cause this type of infection. So if we're looking at the, um, the prevalence of HPV, oral carcinoma, uh, HPV virus causing oropharyngeal cancer, it's, um, it, the, if we're looking at HPV infection, as we know, it's really common in the general community, and there's this bimodal distribution. 
And if you look at the potential for HPV virus in the oral cavity, if um, you're looking at a wash of exfoliated cells in, in the oral cavity, about 6.9% of people will be positive um, for HPV. And of um, those, those subtypes of HPV, only 1% will be HPV 16. So it's actually really uncommon. Um, but what we're seeing is this significant increase in HPV related cancers. And it's probably due to the changing sexual mores um, of in the 70s and 80s, uh, which has then led on to this spike that we're seeing uh, in later years. So if we're looking at the, the carcinogenic, um, the way that HPV causes carcinogenesis, it's related to the early um, 6 and 7 protein, which is a 6 and 7 protein because they affect the tumour suppressor cells of P53 and the retinoblastoma genes. It's actually different between HPV um, positive and negative oropharyngeal cancers as to which one of these is affected. Um, but in HPV 16, you essentially get an upregulation of a wild type of P53 a down regulation of retinoblastoma and then an up regulation in something called P16, which is one of the markers that we can use to look for this type of cancer. So just taking a step back and looking at what actually is the oropharynx, there's four subtype or four subsites of the oropharynx. You've got the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall. And they're the ones that don't really um, come into this type of cancer. It's more importantly, it's the palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils, which sit at the back of the tongue, um, at just near the epiglottis. And these are the two subsites that are really commonly affected by this type of cancer. Why do we, why, why does this happen? Um, the answer really is that currently we don't know why the, the the palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils have a propensity to get this type of infection and cancer. But the idea is that it's like a safe port or safe harbour in a storm in that it's the transition point in between the outside world and the immune system. And essentially the virus just sits at this, um, this transition point and is not detected by the immune system and therefore not cleared. And so you get these crypts within the tonsils where the virus will just sit. There's a permeable basement membrane. Um, and so the problem is that over time it can cause a problem even though infections occurs, has occurred much earlier. So if we're looking at the incidence of oropharyngeal carcinoma in New South Wales, it has dramatically increased over a period of about 10 to 14 years. Uh, but in the setting of um, there not being any overall change in head and neck cancer diagnoses. And actually, most head and neck cancer diagnoses are decreasing, and it's just the oropharynx that we're seeing increasing. And so what are the risk factors that will be associated with potentially contracting HPV? Uh, so um, if you're looking at the, um, the overall risk factors for this, the, it's, if you have more than 26, um, sexual partners in a lifetime, over six oral sexual partners in a lifetime, and if you smoke, you vastly increase your chance of developing this type of cancer. Um, the, that being said, people who have slept with one or two people are still at risk of developing this, and that's one of the difficult questions that you often get faced by patients um, when they're saying, well, my partner, have they been unfaithful to me because they developed this sexually transmitted cancer? So if you're looking at the, the latency of infection and how you get from infection with HPV that isn't cleared to developing a cancer, it's probably around 10 to 30 years. Um, and typically uh, the impact of infection or the impact of the fact that we now have a vaccine won't probably be seen till around 2050. So we're going to do another poll and we're just going to look at what are the common presenting features of HPV related carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma in the oropharynx. So um, Susan, could you mind running the poll again? So just to run through them, uh, is it A, a sore throat, B, otalgia, C, dysphagia, or D, a painless neck lump?
as well, please feel free to ask questions during the presentation. It's funny because I don't get a lot of feedback, so I'm just looking at an, an empty screen, um, but I'm very happy to stop and answer questions as we go along. And 10 seconds feels like a very, very long time. So Susan, do you want to stop the poll now, please? Okay. Uh, so the majority of you are right in, in that it's typically in the most common presenting feature will be a painless neck lump in these patients, followed by a sore throat. But the vast majority of these, so when we look, look back at our data of these patients, it was about 85% that presented with a painless neck lump and predominantly people had no associated features or symptoms at all with them. Um, are we going to go back to the presentation now, please? So if you're breaking it down into the type of um, symptoms that you would get with an oropharyngeal cancer versus a, um, sorry, an HPV related cancer versus a non HPV related cancer, Essentially, the HPV ones occur in a much younger age group, and sometimes, well, the youngest I've seen is 38, um, and but I've, but they can extend up into the the later age groups as well. But more commonly, younger. It's just a painless neck neck mass, uh, and they're really often from a much higher socioeconomic profile than what we traditionally see with head and neck cancers caused by smoking and alcohol intake. So just a brief case presentation. You've got a 49 year old man who comes to see you uh, having noticed a, a lump while shaving and that's the most common thing that they'll tell you. Uh, completely well otherwise and on examination there's nothing to see in the oral cavity but you can palpate a lymph node just underneath the jaw so in what we call level 2A. What would you do next? So just going to another poll um, looking at an ultrasound of the neck or a fine needle aspiration of the neck, a CT soft tissue of the neck or an MRI scan as the first port of call. And Susan, can we just run the poll again, please? Okay, and Susan, can we end that, please? and flick back to the screen. Yeah, so essentially the first step would usually be an ultrasound um, combined with a fine needle aspiration of the neck. And that would be my first port of call, simply because you can get some radiological data from an ultrasound and then some histopathological data from a fine needle aspirate. And the important thing to ask for on the fine needle aspirate is something called P16 because that's what we can use to determine whether it's a squamous cell carcinoma related to um, HPV or not related to HPV. The next step from there would typically be to organise a CT soft tissue of the neck with IV contrast. And subsequently, we would usually present these patients at a multidisciplinary team meeting and often get a PET scan to make sure that there's no distant disease. An MRI scan is useful, but usually only if they're going down surgical planning routes to see if there's invasion into certain spaces that would preclude them from having a surgical, um, a, a surgical treatment. So just to explain a little bit more what P16 is, essentially P16 is a protein that is upregulated in HPV um, 16 disease. It's usually overexpressed um, and therefore it can be used as a surrogate marker for HPV infection. Now, the, the reason why a surrogate marker is used rather than looking directly for HPV is that the HPV um, PCR or H, sorry, HPV ish is much more expensive and much harder to get, and they sometimes run out of the reagents. So, P16 is cheap and easy. Uh, and it's actually got a very good correlation between, um, PC, between HPV disease and um, making sure that it's not, you're not getting false positives. And the reason why it's important with these types of, um, 
these types of cancers is that you have a significantly better prognosis if you have an HPV related uh, cancer of the tonsils uh, rather than a non HPV related one. So for these types of patients, there's essentially two options. And the thing is that there is either one of these uh, excellent and um, excellent options in that they will give you the same oncological survival, uh, whether they have radiotherapy plus minus chemotherapy versus surgery. So it comes down to making sure that each patient is treated as an individual patient and working out what is best suited for them and, and what option is the best uh, in terms of their disease and their anatomy. So um, just taking that step back about whether you have radiotherapy or surgery, essentially you'll have as an HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer patient, about an 85 to 90% chance of five year survival which is so much better than HPV negative, regardless of treatment. So if you're looking at radiotherapy, essentially it's done, uh, it's what's called intensity modulated radiotherapy, which means that it's targeted to the oropharynx and you get much less to the surrounding structures. And this would typically take place over six to seven weeks. And there are significant short and long-term side effects associated with radiotherapy. And the reason that that's important in this disease is that if you're seeing someone who's 40, you have a much longer, hopefully much longer period of time that they will have to deal with the long-term side effects of radiotherapy, which are particularly important in terms of increasing issues with swallowing, taste, decrease in saliva, and sometimes an, a change to, to hearing, which you can get either middle ear effusions or a sensory neural hearing loss. So the, the other thing is that we know from people who receive radiotherapy that they have an increased risk of developing a second primary cancer. And again, if you're 40 and having radiotherapy, you will hopefully have another 40 years in which you could potentially develop a second cancer. So it's really targeted at the younger age group that we needed to look at alternative treatment options. And that's where surgery comes in. So typically when they have surgery, there's two parts to that. They have to have a resection of the tumour, which is either in the, the palatine tonsil or on the back of the tongue, the lingual tonsil. And the second part will be an operation on the neck to remove the uh, affected lymph nodes. Those potentially can be done as a combined operation, but most commonly they're separated by about a week. Um, one of the ways that we can do this operation and something that's made it significantly easier to operate on these types of patients is the use of a surgical robots because it allows us to get around corners with wristed instruments and 3D imaging, which means that you can see the, you can see everything so much better. Um, the, one of the things is that not everyone is suitable for this type of treatment. You can see here where you've, we've got a gag in the mouth and not holding the mouth open to try and get access to um, the area at the back of the tongue. And so uh, if someone doesn't have suitable anatomy, then this isn't really an option and they would have to go down the radiotherapy route. So um, with this type of surgery, it's really important to have a team around you because it's not just about the surgeon, it's about the assistant who sits at the head of the bed. And you can see how much instrumentation you need to get in to be able to perform this type of surgery. Uh, so again, it's, it's a lot about the anatomy of, of patients. So I've just got a brief video um, just to show you uh, what it's like to have um, a surgery done like this. So uh, this patient had a cancer, which is up here. Hopefully you can see my, mark, my um, pointer. It's in the very top part of what's the, of the palatine tonsil. And it's a, what's called a T1 tumor, which is a less than two centimeter tumor. This lady was rarer in that it was a girl rather than a boy, because it's really uncommon to see women with this. Um, and she was in her 40s. So essentially you take out the area of the tonsil uh, and then you have to take around, uh, out the tissue around it as well. And the reason that's important is that just deep to the tonsil, uh, you have the um, vascular bundle, including the, um, the carotid artery. So the carotid artery will sit just under here 
um, behind something called the parapharyngeal fat. So this type of operation would typically take about 40 to 60 minutes. So it's a really quick operation, um, probably uh, um, in terms of the actual surgical time. Um, but the post-operative time of two weeks is like having a tonsillectomy done tenfold. So it's quite difficult for the, them in the initial two weeks. And because there's a really big gap where the, the tissue has been removed, it does take a while for them to relearn how to swallow. But there's very few long-term side effects associated with this. Um, most commonly, the side effects can be a, a slight change in taste. They can develop something called first bite syndrome, which is where you first take a bite of something, you get some pain initially. That would usually resolve within about six weeks. Um, and they can sometimes get what's um, velopharyngeal insufficiency, which is where you get food and fluid coming up through the nose when you eat and drink, but that would usually get better within about six weeks. So um, when we're talking about HPV related cancers, one of the questions that I get asked all the time is how can, uh, can I transmit this to my partner? Um, and currently we don't have enough evidence to say definitely not but the, it's unlikely. When they were looking at, a, a, looking at a study of partners of patients who had oropharyngeal HPV related cancers, even if HPV was detected within the oral mucosa or lining, there was only one, one of those, and it was a, a series of um, 100 patients, uh, and they had 90 partners of those patients participate and only 1% had HPV 16 related disease and they did not develop any form of cancer. Um, and the thing is that right now we know that HPV increases your chance, or HPV 16 infection increases your chance of getting oropharyngeal cancer, but we don't know what else interrelates to this um, and why it is that some people, despite being exposed to HPV 16, will clear it versus other people. Um, the, so essentially the, the, um, the advice that has come out is that there is a small chance that you can transmit um, a tumour by French kissing, or sorry, transmit HPV by French kissing, um, but there's not enough evidence to suggest telling patients that they shouldn't do that with their partner. The other thing is that if they've been together for a period of time, it's likely that if they were going to be infected, they would have been infected already and have likely cleared that disease. So the, the only thing I really tell female um, partners of male patients is that it's really important that they come back to their GP to have a pap smear just to make sure that they don't have an HPV 16 infection. Um, so that was essentially just going through that, that um, discussion about the partners. So next is Gardasil 9, because essentially this is a disease or a cancer that we can prevent with a vaccination. So um, for Australia, we're lucky in that it was put into the schedule for both females and males. Um, well, females, I think it was 2006 and the males was 2013. I may be wrong with that. I'm sorry, you guys will probably know better. Um, but because we've had such a good uptake in this, it's likely that this disease will no longer be prevalent or seen in the future which is unlike a lot of other countries which haven't uptake, um, haven't had an uptake of Gardasil 9 and I, um, successfully. And the thing is that it's been shown that if you just get one of those vaccinations in the three vaccination schedule, that it significantly lowers your chance of developing HPV related oropharyngeal cancers. Um, they've also started a trial recently up in Brisbane where, you, where they're looking at the efficacy of giving Gardasil during treatment for HPV related oropharyngeal cancer and whether there's actually an impact on overall survival if you give the, the vaccine during treatment. So I guess most importantly is when to refer. Uh, at this point, if you've got any patient who has a painless lump in their neck that's been present for more than six weeks, that's one. That's the time to do it. And the other things are an ulcer or sore in the mouth that doesn't heal, and the less commonly associated but still happen symptoms of a sore throat with a foreign body sensation. And I know that you see a lot of patients with that, but I guess if it's persistent for more than six weeks, it's important that someone has a look down with a laryngoscopy, um, a flexible laryngoscopy, just to ensure that there's no um, 
sinister cause for that um, for that symptom. Um, so the next thing is just any if anyone has any questions. We have a couple of questions for you. Sure. The first one, adults who have chronic tonsillitis with exudate in Crips, do they have a higher risk of HPV related oral cancers? Not that we know of currently. So there's no association um, that's been demonstrated between recurrent tonsillitis in adulthood and developing HPV related um, squamous cell carcinoma. It, there, there may be, but it just may not have been proven yet. But as yet, no. Okay, the next question is the last question I have for you. If anyone has any questions, can they please type them up and send them to us now? Uh, the next question is, is the better HPV related survival rate affected by the younger age of patients? Potentially, but um, when you're looking at the whole cohort of patients, um, what we've seen is that regardless of age, you have an increased survival. So yes, if you're young, you're going to go through, you're going to be able to get through cancer treatment better. But that increased survival is a seen is seen across the whole spectrum of ages. So if you're diagnosed, and we still see them, patients in their 70s or 80s diagnosed with HPV-related SCC, that survival benefit is maintained. Well, at the moment, that's the. Oh, here we have another question coming in. Did the original Gardasil vaccine contain strain 16? So the it did, it was 16 and 18. So that was the first one. The second one that came out was the quadvalent, which was 6, 11, 16 and 18. So it was spent most, supposed to cover for genital warts, so which are caused by 6 and 11. And the um, Gardasil 9 you, uh, includes the much lower frequency carcinogenic ones, so it's like 30, 31, 32, I think. But yes, the earliest ones included HPV 16. Okay, the next question I have, any evidence of domestic spread of HPV on cutlery, glasses, cups, towels, bathtubs, toilets, etc.? Well, that's an excellent question. It was in my notes to say it and I didn't, so thank you. Um, there is no evidence of that. So there is zero evidence that you can transmit HPV um, 16 via any of those mechanisms. So the only way is by either sexual contact or potentially by French kissing or deep kissing is what it's called in the literature. The next question, papilloma of the larynx, is there any link with HPV? There is. So um, HPV 6 and 11 cause um, papilloma in the larynx. So again, that will be covered by if they've had vaccinations, but um, it's typically 6 and 11. So yes, HPV. The next question. Do you give Gardasil for patients diagnosed with oropharyngeal cancer after treatment? So right now there's no evidence that it affects it. Uh, there are trials looking into it, whether it, it, um, whether it can improve survival in patients. What I've said to my patients is that essentially you're not going to get harmed by having a vaccine and there may be an it may be a benefit for you so i think it's reasonable to consider it so i've i've had asked a couple of patients to go back to their gps to get vaccinated just because it, if it can improve anything that would be great okay i think that's all the questions we have for you unless anyone would like to quickly put a question through We'll give you a, another minute. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions here. So I think we will um, just thank you there, Dr. Crawford, thank you very much. And we will go on to our next speaker. So thank you for being with us. No problem, thank you. Our next speaker is 
Associate Professor David Lowinger and he will be speaking on hearing loss in adults and children. David? Yep, hi there. <laughs> Hello. Hi, thank you. No problem. Okay, can you see my screen there? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. hi everybody. Uh, welcome. It's uh, great to see you virtually again. Hopefully, I can see you non virtually very soon. Um, and I hope everyone's doing okay during these challenging times still in practice. Um, my talk is just talk about uh, assessment and management of hearing loss in kids and adults. So, I just want to do a brief uh, overview talking about the different types of hearing loss and just how to how to quickly assess it, classify it, decide who needs treatment or not in, um, in family practice. So um, I'll just go through a summary of that. And of course, if anyone has any questions uh, along the way, I'm always happy to, to um, take those questions. Um, so the key points that I want to bring up is that firstly, no one is too young or too old to have their hearing assessed and managed. So uh, there's no such thing as being too young for a hearing test. As you all know, we do newborn hearing screening of newborns and we can certainly follow that up with lots of different types of screening tests. I think it's important to be able to understand your, the patient's audiograms. So I'm just going to touch on that because I often get questions from family doctors about the audiograms. So just to make sure that everyone's up to date and how to read those uh, and then how to classify hearing loss, the different types and just some red flags and then just the current, uh, current thoughts about management of otitis media. So they're the different points I'm going to run through today. Um, so we'll talk about the clinical presentation of hearing loss, assessment of hearing, different types of hearing loss, and then about otitis media concerns. So in kids, uh, hearing loss is very important because it can affect uh, obviously their language and speech development, uh, their bonding, uh, their behaviour as well. So we know that kids who, for example, uh, have blue ear in daycare are often are the ones who tend to bite and fight because they're very frustrated. So sometimes a behavioural concern can be a hearing concern, so obviously very, very important to think about that with your misbehaving uh, toddler or young child. Um, how do kids usually present with hearing concerns? So some of them might fail their newborn hearing screen. So if they fail the newborn hearing screen, there can be a number of reasons. So it might be because they have an ear canal problem or a middle ear problem, or they may actually have a true inner ear problem, which is what we're screening for. So it's always important if one of your patients fails a newborn hearing screen to examine their ears and check the canals and have a look at the middle ears and then to look for them, as long as those areas are clear, to have a repeat test or to treat any pathology there and then go on and have a repeat uh, hearing test, an acoustic emission test. So when someone fails their first hearing test, there's no need to panic, but it needs to be followed up appropriately. Um, sometimes there might be a perinatal history, such as a child who spent a lot, lot of time in intensive care or is very premature, uh, then you might want to check their hearing because they're risk factors for uh, hearing loss. Or certainly if there's a very strong family history of a parent or sibling having a hearing loss, then it's very important to follow those up. The usual presentation is from parental concerns about their child not uh, gaining speech at the same rate as a sibling or as their peers or poor response uh, to commands, poor speech, or, um, or having to sit very close to the television or iPad uh, or other device and having it very loud compared to how everyone else likes it, which is now an increasingly common presentation. In fact, the, uh, the iPad or iPhone is a good audiometer in, the, in that regard. Um, otherwise, they might present with acute infections or discharge or a complication of uh, ear issue, um, or as I said, behavioral concerns, or that you're concerned that they're not uh, presenting at their normal developmental their development, they're not hitting their milestones, or they've got ear problems that are just ongoing and not, not resolving. So they're the common reasons why uh, kids would present. Uh, when, when I examine uh, a child's ear, I always have them sitting on the parent's lap in this position with the parent, uh, one arm around the child, one hand on the head. I think it's very important that parents take responsibility for the children being still when you're examining the ears because sometimes it's a bit of a scary thing for a child to have their ears examined and wiggling and moving makes it dangerous for everybody. So this way the parent takes responsibility for comforting and holding their child and lets you have two hands available to examine the 
it's always look at the patient, the ear, and then work my way inwards is the way I tend to do it. That's the system that I do, is look at the patient, their face, their facial movement, uh, then look at the external ear, around the ear for any pits or, or concerns, uh, look at the shape of their pinna, and then at the ear canal, the uh, ear canal, the lumen of the ear canal, and then go on to the tympanic vein and middle ear. Uh, and then look on for different types of hearing testing depending on the patient's age, whether that's a startle type hearing test, a whispered voice from distance, or going on to tuning fork testing and then uh, proper audiometry. And then of course, with the examination, looking at the nose and throat and connected areas, all very important as well. So as I, I tend to have an outside in uh, examination, starting with the external ear, uh, moving, my, moving my way inwards, ear canal, lumen of ear canal, uh, middle ear, and then check the inner ear. Uh, always important to remember, of course, to look at the top part of the eardrum when you examine a tympanic membrane, the pars flaccida, because that's where cholesteatomas occur. So a perforation or inflammation or problem down here is routine. One occurring up here may represent a pathology hidden up in the attic part of the ear, which you can't see otherwise, and that's where cholesteatomas tend to fall. So uh, always when looking in the ear, remember to look up and, and, and actually make a point of looking at the pars flaccida as well. The puffer is uh, on my otoscope. Oh, we can do this because I'm in my office, so the otoscope a little puffer to look at eardrum movement as well. So it's always a really useful thing to have attached to your otoscope if you can. Um, assessing hearing, so newborn screening, we do otoacoustic emission testing, which is uh, just an electrical test of hearing, so it doesn't involve any cooperation, but it is, it is affected by, uh, by fluid in the middle ear, problems with the membrane, or problems with the ear canal. Um, the VROA testing, which is visual response, uh, response uh, audiometry, so that's when you have a puppet box and the child is playing and you make a sound and they turn around and then the um, puppet lights up to, to give them a response. So uh, you can check children from about, about seven to eight months of age using that kind of testing. Uh, then older children do play audiometry, which is they wear the headphones and they uh, put a peg into a box when the sound is made, then onto more formal audiometry and timonometry. And then the other electrical tests occurring like VERA. So if I have a child who say has severe autism, um, or very syndromal or not otherwise cooperative or too young, then a sedated vera where they're actually sedated in hospital and we do a hearing test looking at those electrical potentials. So no one, everyone can have a hearing test if they need one. Uh, I just want to touch on reading audiogram. So many of you may well know how to read an audiogram, but as I said, it's something I'm commonly asked. So I just thought I'd touch on it here. So if it's old news, apologies. If it's new stuff, fantastic. So the way the audiogram works is a graph where we have, oh, where did we go, sorry, there we go. So on the x-axis uh, is uh, frequency. So that's like a, I always explain it's like a piano keyboard from low notes to middle C, which is here up to high notes on a piano. And then the y-axis is volume in decibels. So it's like the volume on someone's television now going up in numbers. So that's like the numbers on our television. So an audiologist makes sound in one ear uh, they make it loud and loud until someone can hear it. They push a button and they put a circle for the right ear and a cross is for left ear. So in Australia, it's always uh, circles and crosses. Other countries, they use other types of uh, uh, other types of symbols. So the way to check someone's hearing is normal is to get a hearing test. And what we're looking for is for the hearing to be on or above the line 20. So anything in above the line 20, so quieter than 20 decibels, is considered normal hearing. And then anything that goes down is in mild, moderate, severe, profound hearing loss. So just for some examples, if we look at this patient over here, um, this might be a child who presents to you with uh, a hearing issue or an adult who might say that they can't hear in one ear. And so this is what the hearing test shows. So we look at the um, right ear and you can see the right ear is all high, very high on the audiogram, so it's all normal. But the left ear is different. So there's definitely a difference between the two ears of about 20 decibels, which is a significant difference. These other things are put on which are the brackets. So these brackets represent nerve hearing. So a second test that can be done is to put a, a hearing a device or a sound device directly onto the temporal bone, and that sounds sound directly through to the inner ear. So that bypasses the conductive mechanism. So, and then if you imagine like the ear, so this is the left side one, a right side would be like a, if it's a little face ear, a right ear. So this is, uh, makes it a little bit more complicated, but it's very useful from a hearing test point of view. 
If someone has a hearing test done at like a hearing aid sales place, they're just going to get a standard audiogram like this. But if they do it properly, then they'll have the bone conduction as well as the, the actual thresholds. So I can tell with this patient that their nerve hearing in the left ear is excellent, but their actual hearing is poor. And that gap is a conductive gap. So if it was a two-year-old, they've probably got glue ear. If it's a 32-year-old, they might have otosclerosis or a perforation or something like that that's stopping conduction. So this patient, if they present you with an audiogram, you say, look, you have a mild hearing loss. It's just about 20 to 40. So it's a mild hearing loss. It's in one ear. The right ear is perfect and it's a conduction type hearing loss. If you look at this one by comparison, so this is the left ear here. So this is obviously not normal because it's not all above line 20. And the hearing um, is a mid frequency hearing loss and the brackets follow the hearing. So that's a, that's a sensory neural hearing loss. So in this patient, the nerve hearing is very poor. So this is the one who might have, this pattern is called a cookie bite audiogram, might have a congenital hearing loss. So the pattern of the hearing loss can help uh, as well as the position of the hearing loss. So for example, in Meniere's disease, the hearing loss tends to be in the lower frequencies and then comes back up to normal. If someone is old and they have a hearing loss, the hearing loss tends to be sloping down in the higher frequencies. If someone has a congenital hearing loss, it looks like this. So the pattern of hearing can also be helpful. But I just want to make sure everyone's happy with how to read an audiogram. So when, you're, when you see them, um, you, you know what, what they mean. So different types of hearing loss. So there's uh, conductive and sensory neural are the way we define different types of hearing loss. So for sensory neural hearing loss, it can be either congenital or acquired. So obviously when I see my infant and pediatric patients, I'm more looking at usually the congenital type, but they can also be acquired. With the adult patients later on, so hearing loss, it's, it's obviously an acquired hearing loss. It's, it's rarely then of congenital nature. Um, a congenital hearing loss might be of two of, of a different type. So it might be what's called structural, which means it's actually a problem with the temporal bone. So we have a temporal bone here, um, this is a temporal bone. So that might be a problem with the cochlea, with the semicircular canals, or with the inner ear structures such as the vestibular aqueduct or the internal auditory canals. So structural problems in the temporal bone might lead to hearing loss in some. Others might be non-structural. In other words, there's nothing to find on a CT scan. It's all normal, um, but they still have a sensorial hearing loss. Um, and then they can be non-syndromic or syndromic. And I've just listed a couple of the important syndromes here that, we, that are, tend to be associated with hearing loss, like ushers and Alcorts and Wardenbergs. Wardenbergs are the patients have that white forelock, dark hair, but a white forelock. Um, and have the heterochromia. Um, ushers have the retinitis pigmentosa and the sensory hearing loss. So it's certainly associated with some syndromes, but other times it occurs uh, of its own accord. Acquired hearing loss uh, can be of infective nature. So the torch teta, which is um, looking at the different uh, viruses, so things uh, toxo, rubella, CMV, um, uh, you know, different viruses that can cause hearing loss. Um, and then obviously later concerns such as infantile meningitis, a trauma, a cerebrovascular accident and birth, all those things can lead to a hearing loss. The ones that are high risk are the ones that do have history of premature birth, very low birth weight, severe jaundice, um, multiple pregnancies such as a twin or a triplet, or someone who spent time in, in the neonatal intensive care. So they're all increased factors. So if a child has that history and they come to you and the parents are concerned regarding speech, and it's certainly worthwhile to, to exclude a hearing loss. Uh, what investigations do we do? Obviously, check their external and middle ear. Um, investigation include things like a CT scan to look at structure, MRI to look at the nerves, uh, which is often done under sedation. Um, and then blood tests such as the um, torch teeter, uh, renal testing, because uh, the inner ears and the kidneys develop at the same time. So if there's a concern, we always want to make sure they don't have a concurrent renal problem. Um, similar cardiac, so sometimes you can have a cardiac conduction problem associated with an ear problem, so those things looked at. Uh, genetic assessment um, and a connexin 26, which is a genetic screen, which is the commonest cause of a genetic hearing loss. So that's important for both the child, but also for genetic counselling for the, for, the, um, for siblings and for the parents. Uh, what treatment do we use? So it will vary on the degree of the hearing loss. So some might just be uh, it's a very mild hearing loss, just might need counselling, talking to the parents, talk to the teachers, they sit at the front of the class, um, and prevention measures from making the hearing any worse. So that's really important for the children that you have in your practice who have a sensory neural hearing loss, is to make sure that nothing happens that can otherwise affect the hearing. 
So cleaning the ears has to be done very carefully and properly, no, not, uh, because that, you know, we don't want to damage the ear canal or the traumatic membrane. Any ear infections get treated very quickly. I would normally discuss um, instrument choice as far as really loud instruments to try to avoid those. Um, uh, noise exposure damage, all the things that can make your hearing worse. Um, and in fact, there are some structural concerns which can be associated uh, with things like uh, changes in pressure, things like flying, bungee jumping, playing wind instruments or certain structural things. So it's always good, good to know. Um, hearing aids, so hearing aids can be put in from newborn up. Um, so if it's a child who has a fairly average type of hearing loss, then you might, you might just use normal type of hearing aids. Um, obviously, if the hearing loss is more profound or severe and hearing aids won't cope, they may need a cochlear implant. Um, there are also amplification devices. So Hearing Australia, the government organisation, is very good. So I would normally involve them with my patients who have a sensory neural hearing loss, especially the kids, and they can have speakers on their desk. The teacher wears a microphone and other aids. Adults, they have things like uh, telephone adapters which amplify a telephone or flashing lights on the telephone so in rings they can see it rather than hear it. So there are lots of different options that we have. For adults, sensory hearing loss is usually related to number one is age deterioration. So as we get older unfortunately just like with our vision our inner ears tend to wear out like any electrical instrument so that leads to an age related change which tends to be more in some families than others. There must be a genetic predisposition to that. Um, there's sudden onset sensory hearing loss syndrome which is very um, important um, and uh, I see that commonly. I actually saw two patients today referred in who had that and they're always given urgent appointments because that's, a, that's an emergency concern. So that's when somebody suddenly loses a hearing in the ear which is of sensory neural nature. So the patient comes in to see you, they say, look, I woke up this morning and I just can't hear from my left ear. Uh, you look in the ear, it looks normal, the canal's normal, the tumor remains normal. You put a tuning fork on their head, it goes to the other ear, showing that it's the nerve hearing loss in this ear, not conductive, and that you know that it's a sensory neural hearing loss. So that needs uh, urgent review, urgent steroids, um, and then investigation and treatment to try to treat that. The reason it's urgent is because the sooner you get on and treat a sudden onset hearing loss, the better chance you have of saving the hearing and getting better. If you leave it three weeks, a month, then the chance of any treatment work is, is very small. Um, ototoxic medication, so um, uh, obviously in the old days, gentamicin, which was quite a common medication. Um, again, I actually saw a lady today who had been given gentamicin 10 years ago and was dizzy when she was on it and has a sensory or hearing loss from it. Um, so I, these days it tends to be more topical medication. So if somebody has a perforation, not using uh, something like Sofridex, but using more siloxin or something's not going to affect the inner ear. Uh, many ears disease can be associated with a sudden onset hearing loss that is associated with ringing and dizziness and that can tend to recur. Um, ear trauma, so a trauma to the ear from like a slapping injury can not only damage the tomato member, can damage the oval window and the round window and lead to a hearing loss. Uh, barrier trauma as well, you can have a, a leak of perineal fluid which can lead to a nerve hearing loss. Um, autoimmune concerns, so some, you can have autoimmune hearing issues where uh, people tend to have a fluctuating hearing loss related to their autoimmune status. Uh, and then of course things we don't want to see which are CVAs, vascular concerns with inner ear or uh, tumours such as an acoustic neuroma or a cerebral tumour. So that's why if someone has a new onset, asymmetrical, unusual, not typical age related hearing loss, we'll investigate them with imaging. Um, so the most important thing about adult hearing loss is solely progressive versus acute onset. So a solely progressive one is going to be like an age related hearing loss usually or something like that. Whereas an acute onset one is one that you sit up and take notice of and that needs a priority treatment investigation, things like MRIs and EKG testing and treatment with um, either oral steroids, TTSI, which is trans steroid injection, that we do for a sudden onset hearing loss, and sometimes even hyperbaric oxygen therapy for a sudden onset loss. Then if we look at conductive hearing loss. So conductive hearing loss, again, from the examination point of view, is going to occur from the external ear canal. So you might have a child who's missing an external ear canal or has an extremely narrow one. So some syndromes such as Down syndrome associated with a very narrow uh, ear canal. Um, so that might, that might cause that type of a, um, a conductive type hearing loss. Um, then a problem in the ear canal such as well, wax occlusion or a foreign body or uh, skin debris or psoriasis type debris. So that might cause a conductive hearing loss. And then we go into the tympanic membrane, so a tympanic membrane perforation or inflammation, uh, an acicular 
a glue ear problem, so a problem in the contents of the middle ear, uh, which might be an acute otitis media or a chronic suppurative otitis media or cholesteatoma, so skin in the middle ear, um, an acicular anomaly or obviously otosclerosis in adults. So if you think about a conductive hearing loss, so we've got our normal ear up here and then our big lump of wax blocking this ear, a nasty otitis externa, which is uh, causing obstruction there. This is a fungal otitis, so infections can cause conductive hearing loss because it blocks the canal. Uh, this is an exostosis, so a surfer's ear in an adult where it's, they have a very narrow canal. Uh, and this is a very inflamed, infected, angry uh, ear canal, which is from trauma. Um, so you can see big blood clot in the ear canals. So those trauma can also cause, obviously, conductive hearing loss with the bruised eardrum, perforation, bleeding in the ear canal. Um, so more middle ear pathologies. So look, it can be really hard sometimes to determine uh, a normal ear versus a, a middle ear effusion. So you know, here's a normal ear, here's a glue ear. So they really can be really subtle or hard to tell. So the things I look for is more, not so much the light reflex, which you can see in both, but more dullness of the tympanic membrane, uh, the appearance of a tan colored mucus in the middle ear, which we don't have so much here, um, big blood vessels on the eardrum, uh, and then using the little puffer, the eardrum doesn't move. So they're the things I look for, um, but it can be a really hard call sometimes if someone uh, has a glue ear or not. And acute otitis media obviously is more obvious because it's red and bulgy and angry, and all of you have seen that and know it all back to front. So I thought I'd just touch on um, the different types of otitis media while I'm talking about that. So there's acute otitis media, recurrent acute otitis media, and then glue ear. Um, and there's different ways of managing those concerns uh, and different risk factors in uh, patient history. And then you sort of think about who needs grommets and who doesn't, how that's changed over the years. Um, so just to touch on this while we're talking about conductive concerns. So otitis media is just having middle ear fluid. So any fluid in the middle ear is considered otitis media, whether that's thin, watery, or thick and uh, gunky mucus. Um, acute otitis media is when it's pus with associated signs of infection, so usually pain, temperature, other inflammatory signs. Um, recurrent acute otitis media is when you have more than four episodes of acute otitis media in a year. So if it's recurring that quickly, then that's recurrent. That's usually because there's ongoing glue ear causing concern. And then OME or glue ear is, is just when there's uh, fusion without any features of acute inflammation. So you know, we've got a normal, our acute otitis media, our recurrent otitis media, and a blue ear concerns. So with acute otitis media, do you manage it medically or not? The commonly asked question. And there are different schools. There's the American, let's be aggressive with it school, and there's the English, let's not do anything school, and there's the Australian, which is kind of the, uh, let's take the best of both worlds and do what we can school, kind of like with everything else. So um, with medical management, what we tend to do is that if someone, if a child has a high temperature, that's not coming down with symptomatic treatment like Panadol and Nurofen, um, then I would treat that child with antibiotics because then the risk of a more suppurative complication is higher. Or if a child is less than two years old, then I would also look at treating them more aggressively just because they, again, are in a higher risk group for suppurative complications, which can be mastoiditis, facial nerve palsy, meningitis, and those things, and, and not clearing the middle ear. So the older the child, the better their eustachian tubes, the better chance they have of clearing it with a bit of Panadol, Nurofen, and maybe some decongestant. But yeah, the younger the child and the higher the temperature, the more I would treat with antibiotics. That's the tip rule that I tend to stick by. Otherwise, if they don't fall into that category, then I would, in general practice, I would treat symptomatically and get them to come back in a few days and look for the year to be clearing. And then if it's not clearing, then look at other treatments. So um, for these sorts of concerns for acute otitis media, we tend to use it if, uh, if they have severe otalgian pain that's not resolving or severe otitis media um, that's not, not winning with medical management, such as a good course of antibiotics. Um, if the patient has immune compromise, such as a child with um, leukemia or another immune issue, um, or if they have suppurative complications. So that would be like a mastoiditis, so swelling, redness, fullness behind the ear, um, a facial nerve palsy, or meningitis, which are the three complications we don't want to see of an acute otitis media. Um, so if we have a look here, for example, this is a child who presented uh, to my practice with a facial nerve palsy from acute otitis media. So this child woke up um, and when they woke up, this is the picture here up on the left is how their face looked. So mum picked them up out of bed and when they cried, they could shut the right eye, but they couldn't shut the left eye and the side of the mouth didn't move, which is obviously extremely distressing. 
Um, so having a look at that child, so lots of different causes of facial nerve palsy, but in little kids, uh, an acute otitis media is one of the things you could hope and think about. So this is their, this is a picture of their tympanic membranes. This is what the eardrum looked like. That child so it was red, bulgy, angry. So the reason that children get this sometimes is if they have a de dehiscent facial nerve in the middle ear. So if the facial nerve is dehiscent and they have pus under pressure, then that causes a vascular compromise to the facial nerve which stops it from working. So that's what happened here. This is um, a grommet. So this child had emergency surgery. They were in, within theatre within an hour um, and had a grommet put in. So this is the pus draining out of the middle ear through the grommet. And it instantly relieves the pressure on the, uh, on the facial nerve. And this is the child just a couple of days later uh, where the face is back to normal and symmetrical again. So that sort of thing is a medical emergency, similar to meningitis similar to a mastoiditis. So you just want to get in there, get the, get the mucus out as quickly as you can. So what about recurrent otitis media then? So just childhood gets ear infection, ear infection, ear infection. So normally if we say that if they have recurrent episodes over a few months, then they're just needing greater courses of antibiotics and uh, especially the child becomes quite unwell with the acute otitis media. So initially you would manage them medically, if they're not, if they're, if they're having more than four episodes, no, there's no hard or fast rule, but about four episodes um, of recurrent infections, not clearing, ongoing, the smaller the child, the worse, then you would look at putting tubes in. So that's where we judge it. So you would also look at their other risk factors, age, uh, nasal obstruction, adenoids, comorbidities, uh, and then make the decision. And family history is often a good indicator. It's amazing how many kids who have middle ear problems have the parents or the sibling or the cousin as had grommets or had concerns. So family history is a really, really important thing to ask for. So what about chronic otitis media, a controversial area? So do you treat it or not? What causes uh, OME? So usually it's poor eustachian tube function. Uh, so a problem with the, with the shape or the nature of the eustachian tube. Then there's inflammation with an upper street duct infection or allergy or reflux that then causes inflammation, which causes the goblet cells to secrete glycoprotein and you get the bacteria and then you get the glue, which looks like this here. So it really is quite tenacious uh, glue here. What are the risk factors for glue here? I said family history, the biggest one, um, daycare centers. So the bigger the daycare center, the more risk. Uh, breastfeeding is protective, so lack of breastfeeding. Early childhood episodes of acute otitis, um, passive smoking, big adenoids and a palate concern. So they're the different risk factors that we have. Um, and usually it's a combination of those um, which then lead to your otitis media. So if you have big adenoids but not the other stuff or vice versa, then you may not get it, but it's usually a combination of the above. Um, they usually present with hearing loss, speech delay, as well as discomfort and balance problems, as well as recurrent. Some never have infections, some have recurrent infections. You examine, look for it, which you're all very used to. Um, so why, why treat it? So if it persists more than about three months and it's got a poor prognosis of clearing, so only about a third within clear of six months and uh, similar about a year. So it's usually bringing hearing back and avoiding complications. Um, when it comes to hearing, I said no child is too young to have a hearing test, depending on which type we use. So a child with a middle ear concern, we can always check their hearing. Um, the reason it's important to, to check it is that if you look at speech sounds, this is their audiogram, which you're used to reading now. So if your hearing is normal, you can hear all of these speech sounds. If you have blue ear, your hearing is normally like this. So you miss out, sorry, like this. So you miss out on all of these speech sounds. So that's why their speech sounds muffled. So you can do all the low frequency sounds, but you miss the high frequencies. So that's why it's important to treat in the early, in the early childhood if they have a concern there. And usually their tympanometry, instead of being a nice rounded tympanometry with the eardrum movement, is usually quite flat. And so then it can have, you can have learning, behavioural and other complications. Um, and sequelae complications, we are just finishing off now, um, can be chronic perforations from the eardrum thinning, atelectasis where the eardrum's thinned and sucked in, um, tympanosclerosis and ongoing fluid in the middle ear, and then chronic perforations and chronic more middle ear concerns. So that's why we treat it. So, Watch for, for glue ear problems. You can try a course of antibiotics. You can try some decongestants. But from a study's point of view, um, the thing you originally, if they don't clear otherwise by themselves, then you need to do something about it. And the, um, the pneumococcus vaccine has led to a reduction in, in otitis. Um, so who do we consider for tubes? Complicated in, acute infections, protracted recurrent, acute otitis media, or kids who have uh, glue ear that's persisted with hearing loss or a structural issue or other associated concerns. Um, so just in conclusion, um, 
with the other child who has that concern, you can try medical intervention first. And if you're not winning, then we go on and look at other interventions. Um, so I hope from this talk that you know how to read audiograms. Um, just think quickly now when, when you see patients about how to classify hearing loss into conductive and sensory neural, and then which ones are red flag urgents, which are the acute adults um, or the kids who have other associated issues, and just to touch on the management of OEP. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one question for you at the moment. Anyone else with questions? Can you quickly put them through? Uh, asymmetrical hearing loss on an audiogram yes. in an adult with unilateral tinnitus, does it warrant urgent ENT referral? Uh, so if, is it acute onset or more chronic? So certainly if it's acute onset, then I think it's worth looking at quickly because it might be a sudden onset sensory hearing loss syndrome or it might be a type of many years without the dizziness. Um, if it's more long standing, then certainly it needs to be looked at because you need to exclude I mean, unilateral asymmetry, unilateral hearing loss that's of sensory neural nature, you need to exclude an acoustic neuroma. If it's of conductive nature, then you're in an adult, you're more looking at a middle ear problem, which is such as a glue ear problem or otosclerosis. So more acute onset, urgent review, less acute onset, needs review, but not as urgently. Okay, the next quest question. Whitish gluggy exudate in the external canal, easiest way to manage it, is it fungal or mixed with bacterial infection? Sure. So a bacterial infection tends to be one of two bacteria, which is either Candida or Aspergillus. So Candida looks white and fluffy like cotton wool, and Aspergillus looks black like soot. So normally uh, ear infection, most ear infections are bacterial, um, usually coming from swimming or from too much cotton budding with the ear. So usually it's gonna be um, a waterborne bacteria or a skin flora bacteria. Um, but the fungal one, so the gluggy mucusy one's usually more bacterial, but the fungal ones are usually ones which are more hard, flaky, and have that black or white appearance. Next question, what is the difference between chronic OM and OME? Yep, um, so chronic means it's been there for more than three months. OME is glue ear, so it's just mucus in the middle ear, and it becomes chronic if it's been there for more than about three months. Next question, where can we refer baby for hearing tests as some audiologists say we'll only do after a certain age? Sure, so it, it depends, it's very much audiologist dependent. Um, so in my practice, we test down to six month olds and in most uh, pediatric, um, pediatric practices that have an audiologist, they will do that. Um, if it's less, if it's, you've got a less than six month old, then I would always want to check the external and middle ear and check those components but then I would do it either at uh, like a Sydney Children's Hospital or Westmead Hospital, depending on where you are, um, or at Hearing Australia, which is the government of the organisation. So for kids, you really want someone who does a lot of, lot of kids. So we, our audiologists here are all paediatric trained, so they do, they've done syndrome of children, all sorts of children, um, but you really, if, if, it's, if it's younger than that, then I would get one at either Sydney Kids or, um, or Hearing Australia. The next question, what is the contraindication for hearing aids? Why do hearing aid shops need clearance from the GP? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really good question. Well, it, that, that comes from the, usually from the government hearing aid form. So you've seen that green government form, it says the, the, on the uh, clearance for hearing aids. Um, look, I think that the clearance usually is just that the patient's ear canal, uh, tympanum area and, and middle ear look, look good and that you wouldn't treat it otherwise. Um, I personally think another clearance should be that the hearing loss looks like it's uh, a hearing loss that would benefit from hearing aids. So my medical clearance would be if their mid to high frequencies are down to moderate severe. So I usually say to patients that if on the audiogram your hearing is down in that 1000 to 2000 hertz area, then that's worth getting hearing aids. And that they don't have a one-sided asymmetrical sensory hearing loss that could be an acoustic neuroma that needs imaging. So I, so my medical clearance would be a bilateral age-related hearing loss of moderate to severe degree with no other complicating factors. And then that's a medical clearance. But I think that's just to make sure that someone's actually looked in the ear and has excluded other, other problems. Okay. Can, uh, sorry, is there any medical treatment for glue ear? Yeah, so look, it's certainly, if the child hasn't had any antibiotics, then studies have shown that like a one-way course of amoxyl is a good idea. Um, if, 
if a child is old enough, I'll usually try some nose blowing exercises. It also depends on the time of year. So going to summer, I'll usually try some nose blowing exercises. You can try things like um, nasal steroid sprays, but their efficacy hasn't been proven. Um, but it's like a one month course. So one week course of antibiotics, one month course of nasal spray can be worth trying in an older child who can blow their nose um, and see whether they, they then review and see if they come to critical. Can you comment on the role of inhaled or oral steroids in acute otitis media or glue ear and eustachian tube dysfunction? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so um, oral steroids um, haven't been, again, haven't been proven to be effective uh, for treatment. But if you have, uh, I usually would use oral steroids more in adults who have more proper eustachian tubes just to try it. If I have someone who's been well, but they obviously have done something that's caused you station tube swelling, then I will may try both inhaled and oral steroids to try to decrease that swelling and bring them back to normal. So it's more effective in adults than children. And children hasn't been shown to be greatly effective because their problem usually is more their narrow eustachian tube rather than just a swollen eustachian tube. Um, but as I said, you, for acute otitis media, usually it's nothing or antibiotics. For more gluey chronic otitis media, then you can try a short course of inhaled steroids in a child or oral steroids in an adult. Next question, how do you teach the patient to blow the nose to clear the eustachian tube in glue ear? Uh, so it depends if it's an adult or a child. So if it's an, uh, an adult, I'll just usually talk about, I'll just explain them how to do a salva pitch that doesn't puff their cheeks out. Um, if it's a child who doesn't know how to blow their nose, um, Look, there are different things to try. Sometimes it's it's things, it's games you play, like the parent holds a bit of cotton or ribbon in front of their nose and they try to blow the ribbon because they have to try to blow out their nose, not out their mouth. Um, for older children, there's a thing called an otovent balloon, which is a, like a balloon you blow up with your nose, and that teaches them how to blow their nose. So they're the things that I tend to do. But if a child is a good nose blower, I would just say every time they brush your teeth, blow your nose, try a short course of nasal steroids, see if it leads to improvement. Okay, the next one, should we organise an MRI first before referring a patient with asymmetrical hearing loss for ENT review? If so, what scan should we order? Sure, good question. Um, look, that, that's an individual uh, choice. Some, some, family doctor, some patients will come with an MRI and some will come for an assessment first and then have an MRI. I think for me, the important thing is the pattern of the hearing loss again. So if somebody has a, a many, typical many ears type pattern, which is more that low frequency one, then I might look at trying to treat and manage that first before getting an MRI scan, see if that improves. Um, but get an MRI if it, if it doesn't. Um, again, it's more for the more sudden onset ones. Um, if you're comfortable ordering an MRI, then, then it's all MRI of the IAM, internal auditory meatus, IAM and brain. So that's what you order. Um, uh, so that's the sort of scan that I would normally order for patients. So a scan at the MRI, IAM and brain. Next question, we have a lot of questions. Uh, what is your preferred treatment for stubborn fungal otitis externa? Sure, so fungal otitis externa can be really stubborn and it can go on for ages. Um, so for frequent ear cleaning, it's really important to clear out the fungus and try to remove as many spores as possible because when they have the mushrooms growing in there, if you leave mushrooms, they'll just keep, keep festering and growing. So regular cleaning, really aggressive, much more aggressive treatment than I would do for bacterial. So regular cleaning, um, so drops wise, it depends how it looks. So sometimes you just would use an acidifying drop, um, like an aqua ear, as long as it's not too inflamed or it sting. Um, medical treatment thing, either kenicomb or lycoportin type drops, are the ones that I would use, which are both quite sticky, which is usually a problem, but that's just the antifungal drops that we have. The problem obviously with treating a fungal one with Sofridex or Saproxen or uh, antibacterial ones is it'll just make the fungus worse because it kills off all the, the normal flora it can So um, antifungals would be mainly canicone otic or uh, local portin drops. And okay. significant frequent cleaning until it's really clear. Next question, does swimming trigger otitis media in children? No. No, okay. so, so swimming, so otitis media, the, the mucus is produced in the middle ear. So swimming itself won't produce it. It was interesting, uh, one of my colleagues in Western Australia had a look at um, children swimming in indoor heated swimming pools during winter and found in his study that they do have an increased incidence of, ear, of middle ear infections, but that's the only link between swimming and, um, and otitis that I've ever heard of. Otherwise, 
swimming's swimming's quite good because it's a middle ear concern. It's not a not a um, external canal concern. So you can't get water up your station tube. It's it's produced. The fluid is produced in the middle ear. Next question: How early in life can co cochlear implants be used? Oh, from basically you know three months, three to six months old. So very very early on in life. Yeah, so kids who, are, kids who are identified on a newborn hearing screen having a sensory hearing loss will usually come to a cochlear implant around the age of six months. Uh, any outpatient hospital ENT clinics in the public system? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, yes, there are. Um, in Sydney Kids where I'm attached, there's as ENT outpatients. It just especially after COVID when it was all shut down, it just takes a long time to get into them. Um, and uh, for children, the Sydney Kids Westmead, there are clinics, uh, children's clinics, they're just hard, hard to get into and uh, take a long time. Um, in the, on the adult side, um, again, there are clinics at Prince of Wales and St Vincent's and St George and the local hospitals. It's just a matter of trying to get into them and um, their prioritisation. So normally in the clinics, they just will prioritise more urgent, life-threatening stuff above more routine stuff. But all those hospitals have, have ENT outpatients. Are cochlear implants better than hearing aids in moderate to severe hearing loss? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so look, the mantra I usually use, if you can get by with a hearing aid, you're going to be better off than having a cochlear implant if you've got a moderate to severe hearing loss. So if hearing aids are working for you, then that's a really good option. Um, if they're not, if they don't stop working, that's or they don't. Your hearing is too poor for those. That's when you go on and look at a cochlear implant. So a good working hearing aid is better than a cochlear implant, un unless the hearing aid's not doing it enough for. Next question: Management of ongoing tinnitus. Oh my goodness! How long do we have? It's Marlene. I don't want Marlene's kids to starve. She hasn't. You you have yet. about nine um, minutes left. Okay, so um, uh, tinnitus. Well, firstly, you have to try to find is it pulsatile tinnitus or non pulsatile tinnitus? So they're different. So, pulsatile tinnitus usually has a structural cause, whether it's an ear or a neurovascular or a systemic cause, um, whereas non pulsatile tinnitus usually can be a conductive, sensorineural, or other causes, how I would classify it. So, firstly, you've got to try to diagnose what causes it, and that changes everything. But say we're talking about the patient who has otherwise completely normal ears, the hearing's not too bad, but they, they have tinnitus, um, then I would always investigate a nuance of tinnitus with a, with a scan and a hearing test and those things. Um, if they're all normal, then there are uh, herbal, medical, psychological and device treatments for tinnitus as needs be. So investigations usually will start with a hearing test and then be guided by there. Sometimes you would do imaging if you thought it was indicated other times not, um, and then management. But say most common tinnitus is associated with an adult onset age-related hearing loss. So the, the inner ears are wearing out, they get the tinnitus noise instead. And usually the best treatment for those people is hearing aids because the hearing aids will bring sound in and by doing that stimulating the nerves will reduce the tinnitus. The other interesting study that just came out recently, the BMJ was saying how um, onset of dementia and associated shame with age-related hearing loss that those who have untreated hearing loss in adulthood tend to deteriorate more quickly from a dementia point of view because they're not getting the stimulation. But um, back on tinnitus, um, there are lots of treatment options. First, try to diagnose the cause. If you can't find one, then treat the tinnitus primarily. Next question, what is the dose of oral steroids for an adult? Yep, okay. Uh, as long as an adult doesn't have any comorbid, if we're talking about now for sudden onset hearing loss, uh, my program is usually a reducing steroid course. So if they're otherwise well, so not diabetic, uh, hypertensive or crazy, uh, then I would usually use 25 milligrams BD uh, for five days and then go to 25 mana for five days and then half, so 12 and a half mana for five days. So that would be my, my initial big hit reducing course of steroids for an acute onset hearing loss. Next question, what advice would you give to someone with recurrent earwax requiring frequent ear syringing? Yeah, sure, good question. So there are lots of ear cleaning products on the market, but as we all know, none of them really work very well in the, in the case of someone whose ear is really blocked. 
So if I have a patient who has to come and see me for regular ear toileting or cleaning, I um, normally talk about trying a prevention course. So firstly, again, is there a cause? So do they have a exostosis or a super narrow ear canal or anything you can treat structurally, or is it just one of those people who makes a lot of wax that gets stuck? Um, and if it's the latter one, um, then I usually talk about the prevention course. So it's no good using Waxol and Ceramol and whatever ear drop you like once the ear is blocked with wax, because it just turns into like, as we all know, just a porridge of blocked waxy goo, and then they really can't hear. So in a patient who has, who has to have regular, regular ear cleaning, I usually say, look, buy some Waxol or Ceramol, but use it once every two months. So every two months, on the first two days of every month, the first two days of every second month, you put some Waxol or Ceramol into you to soften it up so that it can come out without building up like that. So that's usually a prevention course that I would do, as long as there's no other structural impediment. Um, at the moment, a big problem I'm seeing is what I've called the um, COVID-related AirPod ear. So everyone being at home, use, working from home using AirPods, it's just pushing the wax down really hard. So that's causing, I'm seeing a lot of patients who have really impacted ears because of that. So um, telling, you know, those sorts of cases, maybe use headphones sometimes, not, not AirPods all the time, take breaks when you're not wearing, when you're not working, take the AirPods out, don't wear them at night, um, let your ears clear themselves or use the drops as a preventer. Okay. There is a big sales pitch for hearing aids. How does yeah. one select a hearing aid? Yeah, well, I mean, anyone above the age of 50 um, gets advertising for um, hearing aids almost every day. And it's just not, not often not necessary. I mean, I think it's just, it's just like advertising for, for any treatment where some people need it, some people don't. So as I said, not everybody with a hearing loss needs hearing aids. They need their family doctor to look at the different types of hearing, conductive versus sensory neural. Um, and as far as types of hearing aids go, it, it's a whole, it's a huge industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, so the, basically breaking it down though, the different types of hearing aids that are completely in the ear canal and hearing aids that have a little bit that goes behind the ear, which, um, so the one that goes behind the ear is a little bit more powerful and it tends to be more preferred. The one that goes in the ear canals are good for people with short hair or no hair um, because you can't see it, but they tend to block up with wax more easily. Um, uh, our audiologist who does hearing aids, she usually uses uh, Oticon or di there are different lots of different brands of hearing aids. Um, a lot of the hearing aid sales places now are owned by hearing aid companies, so they'll only sell one type of hearing aid. Um, so you just have to be careful. And I, I think it's always wrong to scare, especially older people, about their hearing when it's not necessary. So always just be a little bit cautious about the sales pitch. Should we refer tongue tie patients to an ENT and is there a public clinic at Randwick for this? Ah, okay. Uh, yes, we see tongue ties all the time um, and we usually deal with them surgically. So it's usually us or our paediatric surgery colleagues who deal with those um, properly. Um, our patients are, again, either the ENT or the, um, or the general surgery, uh, paediatric general surgery outpatients uh, would be the public option uh, for those. Um, so that we, we tend to do it that way. Okay, um, are there any particular pet peeves regarding referrals from GPs, e.g. inappropriate referrals or investigations that should be done prior to referral? No, I don't have any, any uh, pet peeves or concerns. If, if there's any concerns, I'll always ring a family doctor and talk to them uh, about a patient or they're always welcome to ring me. But no, no, all good. I think that you always have to be careful with ears because as we know, the most litigated, um, litigated medical legal concern in the eastern suburbs is um, damage from ear cleaning. So I think you always have to be really careful. Now the health, the, um, our funds will usually, our insurance funds will usually settle it. So I just think always be really careful if you're cleaning someone's ears, particularly if they're on um, blood thinning uh, medication, because ears can bleed really easily and they can be damaged really easily. So I think just, just always be careful and um, uh, just like if something, you know, I, and I think, you know, just be sensible as, as you all are and all referrals that I've seen have certainly been very sensible. So there's never any problem. Always happy to, to check it out if there's, a, if there's an ear concern. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful, um, Professor Lowinger. And um, I think we can give you a rest now. You've answered lots of questions. Okay, so no um, I will now um, welcome Dr. Marlene Soma, who will be speaking on paediatric snoring to PSG or not to PSG. 
Hi, can you hear me, Susan? I can hear you. I'm just making you a presenter. Excellent. I'll leave it to you, Marlene. Thanks, David. Yep, I'm just turning off my stuff. Thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, just see from the beginning. And can you see my slides now? Yes, I can. Great. Perfect. Do you need me to shrink the control panel? Okay, how's that? That's fine. Um, well, Great, good evening. Um, thank you to the organisers for asking me to speak today. Interestingly, Colette from Prince of Wales Private approached me back in April when we were on COVID lockdown and as an ENT surgeon, pretty much life had come to a halt because we can't do our job and socially distance. Um, and I said, sure, I can speak on something in October. And little did I look ahead to realise it was school holiday. So I'm actually giving this talk from the Blue Mountains and I asked to go last so my children would be asleep and not talking in the background. And every now and then randomly, there's um, central heating that comes on with a very loud whoosh. Um, and also Susan has my talk as a backup in case uh, the internet's not working well enough. So excuses aside. Um, for this talk, I'd like to provide an ENT perspective on the workup of paediatric snoring. And that's a common presentation that most GPs will see on a regular basis and how to approach whether to refer a child for a polysomnogram or not. I work very closely with my colleagues in sleep medicine and they provide an excellent service in the investigation, perioperative management and ongoing care of children with sleep disordered breathing. However, the number of children with snoring in the community far outweighs the number of beds in the various sleep laboratories around the city. And in the public system in particular, uh, the, there can be a lengthy wait time uh, to be assessed by sleep medicine and then another wait time to get the sleep study. And then some parents might ask, is this step really necessary in their child's overall management or will it affect their outcome? So I have no conflicts of interest and no financial disclosures and I have obtained permission for the clinical images that I'll be showing. So some background on me, post fellowship, I trained in the UK and US in paediatric ENT, and I've been at City Children's Hospital for the last 11 years. And where most of you, I assume, are aware that we are uniquely sited with four hospitals on the one campus, including Prince of Wales Private, and we're interconnected by corridors and lifts. And I have a particular interest in airway surgery, and I see a lot of complex patients, especially those who have been refractory to other therapies. And for this topic, it is important to set the scene as a speaker, because when you ask how an ENT surgeon approaches an investigation like a PSG, the response will vary depending on the context. Though united on what we do as a specialty trained group, when you grind it down to the individual doctor-patient interaction, there are lots of clinician, parent and institution biases that will come into play. So for the surgeon, um, where they trained, uh, the surgical technique they prefer for the adenotonsillectomy and the risks associated with that, what backup they have available at their hospital, what is their interest in the field, do they participate in multidisciplinary sleep meetings, as well as the type of referrals that they see. And, you know, a bad outcome or complication for a surgeon, even if it's not our own and we hear about it, it will actually often modify our behaviour. There are a multitude of factors that patients and their caregivers bring to the piece, and this is often influenced by the GP. So what one might think is acceptable may not be achievable, may be unnecessary, too risky, or intolerable, or too invasive, or too, in too expensive for another. And then of course, institutional biases with not only geography, but resources and access, say to sleep medicine, comes into play and that will influence decision-making when it comes to getting a sleep study. So before we look at when to refer for a PSG, it's interesting to look to the past to understand where we are today. So tonsillectomy is one of the most frequently performed ENT procedures and has been around for over 2000 years. It was initially performed with a fingernail or metal hook, and then eventually from the 16th century with like in these pictures, snare and guillotine type instruments which we thankfully have evolved from, um, though there is still not insignificant morbidity related to the procedure. 
Uh, by the end of the 19th century, illumination was better and the first adenoidectomy was performed in 1867 in Denmark. And the indications for surgery up until then really hadn't been for snoring, but mostly been for infection or to release what was thought to be humours or other systemic and mental conditions. The recognition of sleep disordered breathing being related to the upper airway in children is documented here in the British Medical Journal from 1889, some 130 years ago. And I have Professor Colin Sullivan from Sydney University, and he is the inventor of CPAP to thank for this reference. It may not be the first one, but it makes for a good read with the wonderful title on some causes of backwardness and stupidity in children and the relief of these symptoms in some instances by nosopharyngeal scarifications. And the author was William Hill, an anatomist from Central London's Throat and Ear Hospital. And here's the final summary paragraph where he describes the clinical profile of a child that would benefit from referral and the intervention described in his article was the removal of tonsils and adenoids. So the stupid looking lazy child who frequently suffers from headache at school, breathes through his mouth instead of his nose, snores, is restless at night, wakes up with a dry mouth in the morning, is well worthy of the solicitor's attention of the school medical officer. And seven years later in 1896 in the US, we have published here in the first edition of Laryngoscope, if you see it's issue one, volume one, and this is one of the highest impact journals in ENT. This is an even better read in my opinion by an ENT surgeon from Minnesota describing the effects of adenoid hypertrophy with the development of an adenoid facies, sleep disturbance with sternal deformity, enuresis, waking fatigued and stupid with no interest in books, a secondary otitis media with effusion and the inability to blow the nose with mucopurulent secretions and excoriations which were a source of constant annoyance. And then once the tonsils and adenoids were removed, the boy was much changed 18 months later with a new life appearance and was now full of ambition. So fast forward 130 years, and this is the type of patient most of us ENT surgeons would see on a regular basis. And hopefully you can hear the sound, but it's essentially a child with very high pitched obstructed stertor and pauses. And so irrespective of your geography or type of practice, parents now turn up with video recordings like this one, demonstrating significant upper airway obstruction, interfering with sleep, and describing symptoms not dissimilar to that of our colleagues of the past. And even if you can't hear it, hopefully you can see the pattern of breathing with the open mouth and how the child is sucking in. He actually has some tracheal tug below the pajamas there. And here is a sleep endoscopy I performed on an otherwise healthy child with snoring, showing what I would think is garden variety obstruction of the upper airway. And the wide out of the image that obscures our view of the larynx in the middle is due to the big tonsils on either side being indrawn with each breath with the negative inspiratory pressure. So in my patient population, a lot of people already had T's and A's, I'm often performing detective work to find out where the blockage is for that individual. So knowing what we do know, conceptually for a surgeon, unblocking the pipe to improve the airflow is the obvious solution which has been backed up in the literature now for centuries or well, over a century i should say in fact in 2008 there was a joint position paper from the pediatric section of the australian college of physicians with the australian society of otolaryngology head and neck surgery and this is a paper on the indications for tonsillectomy and adenotonsillectomy in children and they didn't actually go into the diagnosis of OSA or the indications for PSG in this document. However, with estimates of the incidence of paediatric OSA to be one to 3% of the population and possibly higher, it was felt that ENT surgeons are actually underservicing population at need with a potential of only one in seven to one in 10 being treated. And the first recommendation is what I've put up on this slide is uh, that an increase in access to adenotonsillectomy for children with moderate to severe OSA is urgently required. Outpatient and surgical waiting list should reflect this priority. And given the potential for permanent long-term adverse effects in the younger age group, children under five years should be the first target group for increased services. So with statements like that, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, and chances are it is a duck, why and when do we need to send for a test 
to prove that it's a duck. Our understanding of obstructed breathing in sleep and our ability to study and test for it has actually been relatively recent. So on this slide, I've got a historical sketch of sleep medicine as a specialty. And you can see that publications relating to OSA were unheard of until the second half of last century. Each column here represents 50 years in time, starting from the 1500s on the left, right through to the end of the 20th century. And it's only on that far right column that you can see the explosion in literature related to OSA and that's in that dark brown burgundy colour. Now for paediatric sleep medicine, the development was even later still, um, and it was sleep terrors and nightmares that were the leading disorder being studied for centuries, and it was only from the 1970s with the study of SIDS um, that this became prominent in the literature, and then OSA in children was probably a decade even after that. And here's an example of what is involved in a paediatric sleep study at Sydney Children's Hospital. The child's admitted to hospital in the afternoon and there are some 40 odd monitors placed, including some very sticky adhesive for the scalp EEG leads. And then the child is given some time to be accustomed to the appendages, trying to go to sleep in the monitored bed. There are nurses and scientists staffing the lab throughout the day and night, and then times required the following day to review the many, many hours of data. Now at Randwick, this analysis is done by the sleep physicians themselves, but in a lot of other centres, it's performed by a technician, and in some, some places it's even machine scored. But you can imagine with limited beds in the sleep lab, how labour intensive and time intense this process is and why there is a waiting list for the service. And, but here is the example of the quality of data obtained, which is much more than any home oximetry or other ambulatory study will provide. So the PSG is what we call the diagnostic gold standard to differentiate habitual snoring from the various severities of OSA. And it can help with the diagnosis and treatment effects of many of the sleep disorders and also help to titrate pressure support required for those children needing CPAP or BiPAP. So ENT and sleep medicine have intersected in the last 40 years with more understanding of paediatric sleep physiology and OSA. So we're now able to quantify and put labels on what ENT surgeons for over a century already knew was abnormal for a child, affecting their growth, their health, cognition, social interaction, etc. So we now can stratify and quantify with an apnea hypotenuse index or AHI, the number of events a child is having, particularly related to apneas. And this can differentiate primary snoring, which is just the noise without apneas, through to mild, then moderate and severe OSA. We can pick up central apneas, um, where it's, it's not a problem with obstruction, but just the brain sending the signal to breathe, obstructive hypoventilation and so on. And then we can also pick up on other conditions like parasomnias, movement disorders, narcolepsy, circadian rhythm disorders. These are things that my sleep medicine physicians know a lot more about than what I do. So PSGs have not only improved our knowledge, but our patient's journey and care. Now, several years ago, the journey for the snoring child was relatively straightforward and the family doctor would refer them to see an ENT surgeon. We do take a history, office examination, um, and then there might have been the option to watch and wait, or you might have offered adenoidectomy or tonsillectomy, either alone or in combination. So this flow diagram might be oversimplified, but actually in reality, this patient journey through ENT is still appropriate today for the majority of cases. And a PSG doesn't actually enter into this equation. In fact, it has been estimated that more than 90% of patients undergoing tonsillectomy do not have a PSG and we don't order one. And not unlike the description from that first edition of Laryngoscope, the clinical benefit derived is in multiple aspects of the child's well-being and has actually got nothing to do with improving an AHI. So for a paediatric ENT surgeon like me working in a tertiary centre, these days the referrals come from lots of sources, not just the GP, but also from paediatricians, dentists, my sleep medicine colleagues, and I get referrals from other ENT surgeons. And sometimes the patients come already armed with investigations already done and treatments tried. So our clinical assessment involves taking a history, examining the child, and then often now reviewing videos and sound recordings 
that people bring on their phones, not like not unlike the one I just showed. And then depending on the ind individual, there are many other options before heading to a list of therapeutic surgical interventions, which I'll show you on the next slide. If at all, sometimes we watch and wait. And a PSG is only one of those workup investigations from this long list. So depending on that assessment, there is also now a much longer list of surgical options to choose from to open up the right part of the upper airway for that individual. And this extends from the nasal cavity, looking at the turbinates, post-nasal space, which is traditionally the adults. Occasionally the soft palate may be considered, though less often, um, looking down into the tongue base, into where the lingual tonsils are, sometimes tongue base reduction, uh, supraglottoplasty for those who have laryngomalacia, and that can even be in the older age group than the infants. And as time has gone on, there's now the option of hyperglossal nerve stimulation. This is more in adults, but it's starting to become introduced into the pediatric world in syndromic children in the US, particularly in Downs. And this is where there is um, a stimulator, stimulator place to contract the hyper, uh, stimulate the hypoglossal nerve to contract the tongue forward with each inspiration. So the flowchart now is much more complex with arrows actually going back and forth to what I've shown. But as far as we've come and as good as we think we are, there's still lots of room for improvement and we sometimes have to wonder if we are overcomplicating and overthinking things. So in an ideal world with unlimited resources, we would follow these guidelines set by the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, recommending that a sleep study should be performed in all children or adolescents with snoring and symptoms or signs of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Can you imagine the volume of data we would collate and all those extra things we would uncover? But really, in the real world, it's completely impractical and clinically unnecessary, especially with services struggling to keep up with the load as is. Last year, I went to Sleep Down Under, which is um, a big international sleep meeting at Darling Harbour, and listening to my colleagues from pediatric sleep medicine and hearing about their waiting times to get in um, in Queensland and in other states, sometimes it's over a year to get in to get assessed and then have their sleep study. So speaking of ideals, and this is with no disrespect to my sleep medicine colleagues, even though a PSG is called the gold standard, when you think about it, it's actually not the ideal diagnostic sleep investigation for children. We're sometimes waiting lengthy periods to then decide the fate of a child on a single night on a sample that might not actually be representative of what's happening at home, assuming that they keep all those leads on for the whole night and you can get good data. Actually, in my mind, the best test would be one that was performed in the child's own room with their usual bedding and toys, with their own temperature, ambient temperature and sounds. It would measure all the parameters that a PSG does, but with no physical contact or restricting leads. It'd be readily available and accurate easily repeated so that multiple nights could be averaged because I think those of us with children would know that sometimes in a week no two nights are the same. The results were quick, it was inexpensive and all the variables could be quantified together to stratify real risk. And I say real risk because in medicine a lot of scoring systems such as the AHI and other grading things sometimes have arbitrary cutoffs and definitions, and this is often set by our American colleagues. And the reasoning behind it is that so it can comply with the wording required for insurance and billing purposes in the US. So this mythical sleep investigation, if it did exist, ideally it would be able to be performed at multiple points of the patient's journey, as well as after surgical and non-surgical interventions. And I don't mean to criticise sleep studies because I'm fully aware that when a parent brings a child with sleep disordered breathing in, at the end of the day, all they really want is for the symptoms to go away. And as a parent myself, the ideal way for that to happen would be actually with no intervention at all if they grew out of it. Um, but failing that, it would be ideal if the intervention was not invasive, effective, highly effective with minimal risks and side effects. Uh, both in the short and long term, if it had the least impact on the child's life and the family's life, 
It was accessible, expeditious, with the least amount of cost to the individual or the taxpayer. And we all know that adenotonsillectomy and many of those airway procedures that I listed actually don't fit, fit this bill. So it brings me to the question of what do you as GPs recommend when you're presented with a child who snores? How do you decide what to offer when we are aware that our clinical assessment is not always perfect? A sleep study has its limitations, as I've alluded to, and surgery is actually not always curative and has risks, and the resources are obviously finite. So we can turn to guidelines to help us. To focus on the question of when to refer for a sleep study, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine published these 15 recommend recommendations for PSG for use in children in 2011. And I've provided this article as one of your references and pulled out some of the recommendations. Now they haven't updated it and this is the most up-to-date one from this society. So they included, like the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, that you should refer for a PSG if clinical assessment suggested uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome in children, or if there are residual symptoms of OSA, post T's and A's, to assess for residual OSA in children with pre-op, moderate to severe OSA, obesity, craniofacial anomalies, neurological disorders, as well as children being considered for adenotonsillectomy. Now, if you actually look at the list, the first and the last points, which are, they're actually really tough in real life practice. They're essentially saying, if you think the child could have OSA, and that's just on your clinical assessment, or if they're heading to surgery, then you should do a PSG. So that same year in 2011, in the ENT literature, there were clinical practice guidelines published on looking specifically at polysomnography for sleep disorder breathing prior to tonsillectomy in children. And this document was actually updated in 2019 and I have provided this one as your second reference article as well. So compared to the sleep medicine guidelines, I think these recommendations are sounding more achievable. And it states that before performing tonsillectomy, the clinician should refer children with obstructed sleep disorder breathing for a sleep study if they are less than two years of age or if they exhibit any of the following, being obesity, Down syndrome, craniofacial abnormalities, neuromuscular disorders, sickle cell disease, mucopolysaccharidosis. The clinician should also advocate for a PSG prior to tonsillectomy for those in whom the need is uncertain the need for tonsillectomy is uncertain or if there is a discordance between physical examination and the reported severity of the obstructed sleep disorder breathing. So it's all very well and good to have guidelines but how good are we at actually using them? So last year Norman Friedman who is dually qualified both in ENT and sleep medicine uh, surveyed 427 members of the American Society of Pediatric Laryngology. So he got a 40% response rate, roughly three quarters were from academic type hospitals and the other quarter from private practice. And in the US at that time, uh, for these, this particular group, the average wait time for a sleep study was about seven weeks, which is far better than what we've got here in Australia. And this, in, again, in context, this is a group of 170 tertiary qualified pediatric ENT surgeons. This isn't GPs in the community, this is quite a highly specialised group and it's interesting to see these results that, and I've put here the numbers in yellow, of those who ordered a PSG 100% of the time according to the guidelines. And for children less than two years it was actually only 16%. Um, obese children 8%, Down syndrome was higher 27%, um, the need uncertain was 25% and a discordant examination was a bit higher, 58%. And when I look at these numbers and think about our practice at Sydney Children's Hospital, it probably is a fairly fair representation. Perhaps we would be doing a higher group because we have a craniofacial clinic and Down syndrome group being having you know that patient population that we see. Um, sickle cell, we don't see much in Australia and there are very small populations of mucopolysaccharidosis. But actually the under two years old, um, I wouldn't say all of us would be rushing to order a sleep study in that age group. 
And in my mind, the sleep study is an adjunct to our clinical assessment. And whatever the guidelines say, that actually doesn't trump our judgment. In medical school, we all learn to treat the patient and not the test. And to me, a PSG is helpful if there are sleep related symptoms or if the child doesn't fit the typical pattern of presentation. And it can support the need to intervene or reassure us that we can hold off for longer. But ultimately, no test result is interpreted in isolation. And irrespective of the PSG results and the recommendation typed at the bottom of the report, which my colleagues sometimes write tonsillectomy recommended or not recommended, if a surgical procedure is undertaken, actually the ultimate responsibility lies with the surgeon, not with the sleep doctor. A normal PSG does not preclude benefit from intervention in some circumstances, in the same way that not all children with large tonsils require a surgery. And no tonsillectomy, for those of you who don't do it, is actually still one of our most humbling procedures that we do. If a patient with cancer has a major morbidity related to surgery, it's a lot more acceptable than a normal child who snores, who then develops a rare but terrible complication. They have a lot, lot further to fall and we have to live with that. So given that resources are limited, and in fact, that most of the time ENT don't actually order a PSG, what is the worst case scenario that we face if we don't send a child for a sleep study as per the guidelines? Well, uh, we might not get the diagnosis right, and we might be over-diagnosing some that could have improved with watchful waiting. Um, we might underappreciate those with severe OSA, and which may increase their perioperative risk, particularly with sensitivity to narcotics or perhaps respiratory complications due to the anaesthetic. Or we might be subjecting children to non-curative interventions uh, where perhaps allergy management or turbinate reduction may be more important for some. But the reality is the vast majority of the time, having no, S no PSG is not a problem and we get away with it. And I'm not saying me, but most of my colleagues in Sydney and around the state, as it's actually very rare for us, working at one of the two major children's hospitals, to have transfers in from other centres because of post-operative complications that would have been prevented if the child had had a PSG prior. So if you had to pin me down to say, who would I refer for a PSG? I would definitely go for the bad end of the spectrum where I'm suspicious that I'm going to need some help. So this would include those special populations like Down syndrome, uh, syndromic or craniofacial abnormalities because they have a small or narrow face that the box is creating the crowding of the upper airway, neuromuscular disorders because the soft tissue is collapsing within the box, um, sickle cell disease, mucopolysaccharidosis, I've got severe symptoms, which are those Darth Vader sounding children who are snoring almost awake when you see them. And some of them may actually benefit from perioperative CPAP, as well as the extremely obese to help with their anaesthetic risk. Um, in essence, those populations where I suspect my intervention might not be completely curative. And the PSG can then be helpful not only to guide management, but then I've got a baseline for comparison to see how effective we've been. And these groups are the ones that may go on to have the sleep endoscopy, which was that camera down, or further surgery to relieve another anatomical site, or they may even require long-term non-invasive ventilation, such as with CPAP. And then I've got the other end of the spectrum, where I feel like a PSG might help guide whether an intervention is actually necessary. Um, so sometimes we are all unsure of the diagnosis, or there may be a strong parental preference for further investigation or just disagreement in whether surgery is required. Um, there could be other sleep pathology like some of those disorders or just sleep hygiene issues where the poor sleep, the waking up is actually to, to do with behavioural issues and, and how things are at home. I think infants under one are more reasonable than infant than say saying toddlers under two as a blanket statement because a lot of those I think are quite safe to go on depending on their size and what 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 you're seeing. And similar to the guidelines, I would agree that when there is discordance in the clinical picture, say you've got very tiny tonsils and it doesn't gel with our usual familiar pattern of 
um, diagnosis and recognition of what's going on. And then there's the rest in the middle who may be primary snorers or they may have mild, moderate or even severe OSA. And this is where all those contextual influence come into play. So if resources were unlimited and a sleep study was easy to access, of course, we'd all follow the guidelines and everyone would get a sleep study. Though I guess perhaps the results would mostly be academic and it probably wouldn't change management or outcomes. We know that every clinical practice guideline is to be used at discretion. In reality, the biases from the clinician, the caregiver and the institution contribute to this art and science of how we practice, especially for that middle group of patients. There are some circumstances where defining the severe problem can actually help us bump up priority for surgery, because in ENT we have our own issues with waiting lists. But like I mentioned at the opening, that it's sometimes unethical to make a patient wait for sleep medicine review and then wait longer for the sleep study, when if we just got, got on with our part, they could have been cured in that meantime. So for general practitioners, I would say, take a thorough history and examination Ask the parents to video or record what they are seeing, because sometimes that's almost as good as a sleep study. And if it all points to upper airway obstruction, contributing to snoring in an otherwise healthy child, that is no syndromes or other craniofacial problems, then probably a PSG is optional. If, however, you or the caregivers have any concerns, then it's important to get as much information as possible, to help guide the management path. And most ENT surgeons would be able to help facilitate that process because we rely on our sleep medicine colleagues as much as they do on us. And most of us have a good working relationship with them. So in conclusion, uh, to PSG or not to PSG, that is the question. I certainly don't claim to have all the answers, but I hope to have provided you with one surgeon's perspective. And thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have one question. Yep. Uh, does How does sickle cell disease contribute to obstructive sleep apnea syndrome? Um, it can contribute to their oxygen carriage and uh, it, they can, it can precipitate a crisis, um, especially post-surgery. But it's not something that we see a lot of in Australia. I saw a little bit of it when I worked at Great Ormond Street in the UK. Okay, the next question. Is there a best age for T's and A's or when would you think you could wait to see if a child will grow out of it? Um, I don't know that there is a best age. I think the most common age group that we are seeing is in that preschool and early primary and that's when adenotonsillar hypertrophy is at its greatest as a child's immune system is being ex exposed to all the viruses, especially say in that preschool age group with the onset of exposure to childcare or preschool, um, it's often associated with a lot of upper respiratory illness, which then stimulates lymphoid hypertrophy. Uh, as for a younger limit, there are no set numbers that are strictly written, I would say kind of an unspoken rule that we often have would be not under 10 kilos for the tonsils because of the bleeding risk. Um, you know, we, most of us would quote about a 2% or so can be higher risk of bleeding, which is not insignificant. And when your blood volume is so much less than when you were a small child, you know, 50 mil blood loss of spitting up blood after surgery can, can be quite significant for a small child. So in terms of an age, there isn't one um, because you know you can see some very big one-year-olds who are over 12 kilos, and then you can see some three-year-olds who are you know little and the same, only 12 kilos or, or less. Um, so it just depends on, on the size. But I probably, most of us would not take out tonsils if the child was very, very small. Um, probably not under age one, but it is not written anywhere as a rule. The other technical thing about it is actually getting instruments in because a child who is much smaller, their mouth is, is much smaller and to do it, we have to obviously get our, our instruments in and then to get to the adenoids as well, which is up behind the palate. Um, yeah, so if there was, a, say, a child at the smaller end of the spectrum, maybe 
topical treatment with steroids first to try and help improve the nasal airway, maybe then progress to adenoids, and then as the child got bigger, maybe adenotransplantation. And sometimes you might stage it, do the adenoids first and say to the parents, this may not be curative and we might come back and take the tonsils out later, but there are some kids who, who never need to go on to that second, second operation. The flip side, as you get to the older age group, um, most adenoids start to involute, uh, particularly with the puberbal growth spurts. You know, these older children have, like in the late primary, now into the teenage years, have to, tend to have less upper respiratory illnesses or less severe, but also their craniofacial structure is so much bigger. They've got pneumatization of their sinuses, their jaw, their teeth have come out, so it's pulling, pulling things forward and things are going up. So their box is actually getting bigger, as well as their immune tissue may be less active. Um, having said that, you know, I recent, it, it's not a fixed rule and it, it then comes down to the individual assessment. I had a 17 year old boy who was 100 kilos just a few weeks ago and he had huge adenoids. So this, this kid was like twice my size and um, not technically a kid, but he still had quite large adenoids. Um, so there, there isn't a, a, a hard and fast rule, but I would probably say the vast majority that we're seeing are in that preschool and earlier primary age group for adenotonsillar hypertrophy. Next question. What are the complications post-op after adenotonsillectomy in OSA association? Okay, so then from the procedure itself, um, so if I was giving consent to a parent, I would say, well, number one, your child's having an anaesthetic. Assuming that there's nothing else wrong, um, you know, working where I work, luckily we have very experienced anaesthetists, so having the anaesthetic. For those children with sleep apnea, sometimes the concern from my sleep medicine colleagues are if they seem to have altered chemoreceptor responses, which we can pick up on the sleep study. So when they have an apnea, how quickly do they recover from that apneic event? And the children who have a rising CO2, that can be a bit of a worry that perhaps um, they don't have that drive to breathe. And so the concern can be when you give narcotics, which we do because it's a painful operation, that this can then cause respiratory suppression and cause problems in that post-operative period. And these children in some hospitals are monitored in a high dependency or ICU setting. I'm very fortunate at Sydney Children's Hospital because we have a strong sleep medicine unit. We can actually monitor them on the ward because we have the backup of them being able to provide CPAP if needed. Having said that, it's not always easy to institute on a child. I mean, it's not easy to institute in an adult, let alone one who's just come out of surgery. So sometimes they will try pre-operative CPAP um, if they are concerned to try to get the child accustomized to the mask and have the feeling of pressure. Again, variable response to that. Some kids better than, than others. Sometimes they surprise you. Some of the syndromic kids, um, a few of the Down syndrome, I wouldn't say all of them, but some of them take to it quite well because they actually feel so much better on the CPAP. But then also, so then, Related to, um, actually before I go into the, the bleeding and the other things, with regards to then post-operative analgesia, then we have to be careful with what we give them. So usually Panadol regularly, and once upon a time it was pain stop, which was the Panadol codeine that was taken off the market because in the US it was found that a few people were ultra metabolizers of the codeine component and especially those with sleep apnea, then they ended up with respiratory depression if they were dosed with the codeine component and it's hard to predict, and they had a few deaths. Now that didn't happen in Australia. However, the product was taken off the market for tonsillectomy in that the writing on the bottle that specifically do not use after a tonsillectomy, and it was for that specific reason with the sleep apnea group. So, once upon a time, a lot of ENT surgeons were very against non-steroidals, but when the pain stop was taken off the market, then we turned to our colleagues in Europe 
uh, in the UK, a lot of them who had been using Nurofen as a routine in the post-operative period and who didn't feel it caused increased risk of bleeding. And a lot of us have been a lot more com comfortable to use Nurofen. Um, and then the alternative now is oxycodone endone in a liquid form. This is dispensed only in the hospital pharmacies and the dose um, is 0.1 milligrams per kilo, but we will use less in the severe OSA group, sometimes a half or a third of a dose of that, or even not at all. If the sleep medicine team have picked up on a sleep study that um, there is an issue. Now, in some centres, uh, tonsillectomy is done as day surgery, and even individual surgeons around Sydney will, will send people home on the same day. Um, it's a bit of a cultural thing, like in New Zealand, it's pretty much routine in Auckland. And when I worked in the US, it was very routine. In fact, it was unusual to keep anyone overnight. I guess an advantage of the overnight stay is that we have the ability for oximetry um, as, a, as a routine to watch how a child is progressing to pick up on any of those issues. And then the other risks of anotransillectomy are particularly related to, to bleeding, as I mentioned already, um, because the healing is by secondary intention, there's no sutures, and the tonsillar fossa is just left to granulate, which will take usually the full two weeks, sometimes longer, probably three, realistically. But the highest risk of a bleed is said to be around day seven to 10, which is in that second week, which is why we tell families to keep their children home from preschool or daycare or school, as well as for adults to stay home from work because they might start be starting to feel better and getting back to normal activity, but that is when, when the bleed can, can happen. Next question. With increasing childhood obesity, do you think you will see more adult style sleep apnea in these kids in the future? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I attend the multidisciplinary sleep meeting, so it's every fortnight at Sydney Kids, and they, we present. Well, the sleep team presents all their interesting cases, and there seems to be a range. I mean, obesity is increasing definitely, and it's really a, a difficult problem um, where it's actually the adenotonsil uh, hypertrophy. We can do our surgery, but actually like my 100 kilos 17 year old, I said to him, well, look, you need to try and get into a healthier weight because actually, despite everything that I've done and put you through, you might end up on CPAP anyway. So yes, but interestingly, not all overweight children have sleep apnea. The correlation is not, not perfect, but yes, we will be seeing more more people who might need that non-invasive support because you know when you put on weight, what people don't realize is all the, the soft tissue that's carried centrally as well as um, in the neck tissues and, and all around that. And that all narrows the airway. And uh, just, you know, as you lose your tone when you go to sleep, just, you know, that few more millimetres of space can make a big difference. We just have a couple of more questions. We are a little bit over time. Are you happy to answer a couple more? Yes, yes, that's fine. Okay, is it still a rule that over six attacks of acute tonsillitis in a year is an indication for tonsillectomy? Uh, yes, yeah, so there are guidelines on recurrent tonsillitis. So say seven in a year or um, a similar amount over two years um, or three over three consecutive years. But again, it comes down to to that individual family. There are many, many people. I mean, the pendulum has swung over the years. You know, once upon a time, tonsillectomy was mostly for recurrent tonsillitis. And, you know, there was a generation, say the grandparents' generation of now where whole, you know, brothers and sisters lined up to get their tonsils out. Why? Oh, just because we all, it's just something that we did. And then the pendulum swung the other way that nobody got their tonsils out. And I think, you know, we're somewhere back in the middle. I, I have to say, if you have a look at our waiting lists and who is getting done, the sleep disordered breathing is now much more predominant than the recurrent tonsillitis. Um, so it just depends. And you know, those people where this pe pendulum swung from the 70s and 80s, it, you know, a lot of them outgrew it. So you don't have to have your tonsils out, but it comes down to how much of an impact is it having on that child's life, how much time off school, the need for antibiotics, that's not perfect to be having six, seven courses of antibiotics and affecting your microbiome. 
um, per year. So uh, it comes down to that. But yes, there would probably be some benefit. And there are guidelines on that, which I'm happy to provide too. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah. Am I yeah, right yeah. in saying, did, did I ask a question? No. Am I right I in did. saying that a lateral airway x-ray can be use, a useful way of seeing adenoidal hypertrophy in a snoring child in primary care? Yes, it can be, yeah. And you know, for some children, we are able to assess them with a nasendoscope. I find up to about 14, 15 months, depending on the baby, I can swaddle them and hold them and put a nasendoscope in. And then again, from about age four to five, depending on the child, that in between age group, the two, the three year old, the four year old, definitely um, it's something that I still use as well. And it can be helpful. Uh, the next question's a little bit confusing, but I think they're asking what are the complications um, in a child of four having a routine pre-op sleep study before an adenotonsillectomy? The complications of the sleep study? Um, Not sure exactly what's being asked here. Uh, well, look, I mean, it's, it's, look, some children take to it quite well. Um, you know, I think at the kids' hospital, we have play therapists and they're very uh, patient. It might not be the same experience. And it also comes down to the individual child. Some, people, some kids have a lot of sensory um, sensitivities and don't like you know, things attached to them and it can affect how they sleep. Some of them then just are not restless. It's not a, a normal night's sleep if they're very hyper, hyper aware of that. But um, the, there shouldn't be complications. I mean, it's just, it's monitoring and lead. So the sleep study itself shouldn't create complications. Maybe some of them do get distressed by it. Thank you. I think we will leave it there. It's um, now seven past nine. I'd like to thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to present tonight. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. You'll receive the evaluation link to your email inbox shortly, which will be active for 48 hours. Once the evaluations have been completed, certificates will be provided within two weeks. Please visit our website to register for more upcoming webinars, including our next Prince of Wales private event, which is Plastics, Quality of Care, Quality of Life, on Wednesday the 4th of November, which is our last session for this year. Have a good evening, everyone, and thank you again to our speakers. Good night. <laughs>